So I've come to talk about um, an audit project that was done in Sunderland, um, looking at methods to reduce um, HbA1c through carb count and some diagnosis and also staff education to go along with that. So what we did was, um, this was kind of back in sort of 2012 to 2014, there was an audit done um, in Sunderland looking at HbA1c in the first year following diagnosis. Um, and we'd found that there was suboptimal control gained in that first year. So the current NICE recommendations are for level 3 carbohydrate counting from the point of diagnosis for children and young people with type 1 diabetes. So following this audit demonstrating suboptimal control, um, the unit introduced inpatient level 3 carb counting from day 1 um, and a kind of staff education package to go along with that. So one of the problems with the staff training was that if something isn't mandatory, it's quite difficult to get into process. So the staff training was made mandatory. Um, so, you know, as important as attending your fire lecture was the training on uh, carb counting, um, but more interesting than your fire lecture. Um, and also it was mandatory for all um, staff involved in the care of children, young people and families with type 1 diabetes. So the, a lot of the main education is obviously done by the diabetes team, but in Sunderland the setup is that the children are admitted to the ward for a, a stay of several days, um, and obviously a lot of that education is done by the ward staff. So the ward staff need to have um, as good a kind of education um, so that they can deliver the same consistent messages as the team providing the main input. And it also gives the children, young people and families um, experience of carb counting at different different points during the day and everything as well. So what we did was looked, like I said, at these two time periods, so 2012 to 2014, and then also after the change was made, 2015 to 2017. So the first audit um, was done between those two time points, 2012 and 2014, and we reviewed the HbA1c in that first year after diagnosis for all um, newly diagnosed patients. Um, at that time, patients were started on fixed dose regimens and then were encouraged over the first few months as they got to grips with their diagnosis and the treatment to then begin carb counting um, over those next few months. So we've just got a table there that shows you the trend in the HbA1c that we've seen. So you've got your high HbA1c at diagnosis and then it kind of coming down in your honeymoon period and then rising again at 12 months. The second audit was after this intervention of mandatory um, enhanced training and carb counting from diagnosis. So we reviewed those HbA1c's again at the same points and compared the data with the same period from the first audit. So the results from this, so we had 43 patients in that time period, um, just over half were male, um, just under half obviously female, um, and children and young people who had diabetes um, secondary to steroids or children with type 2 diabetes were not included in this, it was just looking at the children and young people with type 1 diabetes. So out of these, um, this sample that we had, um, so most of them had an HbA1c available to see at 6 weeks and 3 months, 70% and 86%. Um, and then at 6 months and 12 months, everybody had an HbA1c available except for one missing data point, so we did kind of get a good representat representative um, data set. So the results from um, audit two are shown in the kind of bottom row there. So again, you've got your high HbA1c at diagnosis, um, and then kind of coming down um, again at these points. And then the interesting kind of point here is the 12-month HbA1c. So we had an HbA1c there of 54.4 compared to in the first group of 62.9, um, and we found that that was statistically significant when we looked at it with a with a t test. Um, the other points, they weren't statistically significant, but this 12-month one was. Um, and then just at the end here, we've got the um, national unadjusted mean. So we are seeing an improvement there, kind of over and above the natural improvement that obviously occurred with time, um, with the kind of national trend. So out of the patients that we looked at, so about half of them did achieve an HbA1c of less than 48 at some point in the first year after diagnosis. Um, and 83% of them achieved an HbA1c of less than 58 um, in the first year after diagnosis. So looking between the two groups, so we had a reduction in HbA1c at 12 months of 8.5 millimoles per mole. Um, 
from 62.9 in the first group to 54.4 after the intervention. Um, and during the same time period, just to say again, the, the total mean had reduced by 2.7. So some conclusions that we drew out of this were obviously that we did get that statistically significant improvement in the 12-month HbA1c across the audit period. Um, and the change that we'd made between the two sets of data was the introduction of the immediate carbohydrate counting from diagnosis um, and the enhanced ward staff training. Um, and again, to say that the reduction was in excess of what you might expect to see through kind of time alone as a factor. So from this, it obviously supports the introduction of the level three carb counting at diagnosis for children and young people with type one diabetes, um, which is part of the NICE recommendations. Um, and it does support as well the fact that enhanced training to the entire kind of wider multidisciplinary team um, is beneficial. So everybody involved in the care of children and young people with diabetes should have um, access to this education. Um, and particularly the wider multidisciplinary team is important as well because your ward staff are the ones who are going to be doing you know, the breakfast carb counting, the evening meal carb counting. It's not necessarily going to be a specialist nurse or a consultant um, diabetologist. So it's helpful for everybody to have that same um, training. And also training sessions um, to look at for other ward staff as well. So on your ward, you've also got junior doctors who rotate through different rotations. You've got healthcare assistants. Um, and what we know is helpful is if people are promoting the same kind of consistent message. So if everybody's had access to the same training, then people can consistently promote the same message. And that's going to be you know, more helpful um, to children, young people, and their families as they kind of get into groups with all of this. Um, in terms of kind of looking at this data again, so with the um, quality improvement collaboratives that are coming, um, then it's going to be worth looking at this again um, as the service kind of moves more to a more patient-led service to see if we're getting the same um, improvement if it's, or if things are changing um, as well. So just thank you as well to everybody else who was involved in collecting all of this data and looking at it. And that was that. So any questions or anything? Thank you.